Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Thank you because whenever we come together, you are always with us. Your presence is always there. And when we study, your spirit is always available to open the pages of the scriptures to us and to make the application to our personal lives. We're praying, Lord, that as we come tonight, your spirit will still take the word and apply it to us at the point where we are so we can profit by the study of your word in Jesus' name. We're praying that tonight everyone here will hear your voice, will see your word, will have the application in their hearts and lives, and will be the better for the study of your word in Jesus' name. We pray that all who are here, workers and members, and uh, visitors and invitees, every one of us will get something good out of your word in Jesus' name. Speak to everyone, Lord. Strengthen us because of the study of the word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We've been studying the first epistle of Peter. And we've gone through chapters 1 through to 4. Today we come to the last chapter. And we're now in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. In these verses, Peter the Apostle, as well as a pastor, he has a message for people in the church, both the leadership and the laity. That is, he has a message for those who are leading. And he has a message for those who are following. That's why we've titled the message of today, the study of today, the leaders and the laity in the church. Why don't you open your Bible in First Peter chapter 5. I'm reading there from verse 1. First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither has been lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the sheep shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, see younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, ye, all of you, be subject to one another, and be close with your humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that ye may exalt you in due season. Please add verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. As you look at those verses that we have read, you will see something very clearly that Peter, as he was instructing the church, he had Christ before him. Christ had chosen this man in the early years when the Lord called him. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He never forgot that the Lord was using him as an instrument, as a hook, as a net to draw out the fishes of men, that he is to draw out men created by God to come to the Lord, to come to the Redeemer. He had been appointed, not just as an evangelist, calling the men out of the world and into the kingdom. He was also appointed as apostle, sent by the Lord, that he will establish churches in his name. Not only that, he will be pastor also. That means a resident teacher, feeding the flock of God, taking care of the flock of God, and see to their development and to their growth. And he never forgot everything that he learned from the Lord himself. If you remember the relationship between Christ and the apostles, you remember how he took the towel and he guarded himself and he put water into the bowl. He washed their feet. And then he told them, what I have done, you do to others also. That lesson never left Peter because he now talked about humility. Talking to the younger, he said, be humble. And then he said, yes, even to all of you, 
I'm telling you there's something important for those who are high and for those who are low. It's to be humble and to be subject one to another. If you pick it from the very first verse, it talks about Christ. And it says, he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And he had seen how the Lord suffered and how the Lord affirmed everything he taught by the very life he lived. In verse 2 he said, feed the flock of God. And you must remember what the Lord had told uh, Peter when he asked him, lovest thou me more than all these? And then he replied, yes, I love you, Lord. Feed my lambs. And then he asked him again, Simon Peter, do you love me more than all these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep, he said. The third time, he called on him again, Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, you know all hearts. You know all things. And you know that I love you. Then he told him, feed my sheep. He never forgot to feed the flock of God, the sheep in the flock of God. That was now passing to the elders and leaders in the church. He said, there is one thing you are to do. There is one reason why you are appointed to feed the flock of God. And then his thoughts must have gone to the very fact that Jesus Christ had told them that the kings of the Gentiles exercise authority over them. But then he said, it shall not be so among you. He wanted his church to be different from the world. He wanted humility rather than lordship over the people of God. That's why he told them in verse 3, you leaders, you will not be as lords over the heritage of God, over the people of God. And then he said, you must wait. You must be patient. When the Lord will come again as a chief shepherd, he will reward everyone. And then he rounded up the passage we are looking at by humility, telling us that every one of us must be closed with humility. There are two things you want to find out about the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, he had a message. Number two, he gave a model. Number one, he gave an exhortation. Number two, he was an example. And with the exhortation and the example, the message and the model, Peter never forgot. And following after what he had seen from the Lord and what he had from the Lord, he now exhorted and he counseled and he admonished and taught the people of God. Those are the verses we're looking at today. We have divided the study into three parts. Number one, motive for ministry to the flock. Motive for ministry to the flock. Number two, model for the members of the fold. The model for the members of the fold. And then number three is the members' humility in the fellowship. The members' humility in the fellowship. We come to point number one. The motive for ministry to the flock. Please read again as I look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, which we are looking at today. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who also am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What did he have for them? What message was he sending to them? Feed the flock. That's imperative. That's why we're in the ministry. That's why the Lord called us. That's the number one assignment, the central assignment, indispensable assignment. The Lord has given to the leadership, to the elders and the church, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for fear the lucre, but of a ready mind. As you look at Peter, he introduces himself. In verse 1 he says, Who am also an elder. That under makes you understand the use of the word elder in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it just refers to the people that are aged. And because of their age, they are able to sit at the gate of the city. Looking at the problems of the people, settling the differences between the people, helping the people to understand the way of the Lord. When you pass on to the New Testament, the word elder then comes into the very church. And it means that the leadership in the church, whatever the capacity of leadership. In fact, Peter himself, being an apostle, he said, Who am also an elder? And yet we know that the people is right, he was writing to, they were not all apostles. They were evangelists and pastors among them. And then he referred to them also, the elders which are among you. Who are the elders then? They may be apostles. They may be prophets. They may be evangelists, pastors, or teachers. 
They may be leaders over the people of God. But whatever they are, or whatever they were, Peter said, I'm one of you too. I'm also an elder. And now he, he qualifies the eating, verse 1, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He said, I'm also a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Yes, I saw it all. He said, how he was persecuted, how he suffered for the ministry and the mission that he came for, even the climax of the suffering when he went to the cross and he died for the sins of the whole world. I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter is, he uses that word witness a number of times. If you refer back to the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Can, can you see him using the word witness? He said, We're eyewitnesses. It's not a fable, it's not a cunningly devised fable. We saw it, we felt it, we knew it, we were with him, we fellowship with him. We handled him. And we also saw him. And we also heard him. We are witnesses of all things that he did. Not only what he did, how the evil slew him and hanged him on a tree. In verse 40, him God raised up the third day. And we are witnesses of that resurrection to you. And he showed him openly. Not to all the people. When he rose from the dead, he didn't go again to Galilee and Capernaum and all those places. But he showed them himself unto witnesses cho chosen before of God. Even unto us, he said, we saw him when he rose from the dead. Who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. You see how it goes from the cross to the coronation. You see how it goes from uh, the, the, the suffering and then it goes to the supremacy of the Lord when he will be the judge of the living and the dead. It says to whom give all the prophets witness. You know the word witness is saying that even the prophets too by writing they gave witness and they gave affirmation that this Christ is the one that will come and suffer for the sins of humanity that through his name whosoever believeth in him should receive shall receive remission, removal, forgiveness, pardon for his sins. We're back in First Peter chapter 5 verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort I teach, I'm writing to you, and I'm commanding you, and I am also an elder. And there's something to learn there. Elders can teach elders. Because, you see, brothers and sisters, those elders are not at the same level of responsibility. He was an apostle, elder. The others were pastors over churches, elders. But elder, apostle, greater than elders, pastors. He, the elder then, he had the privilege as well as the duty. As well as, uh, you know, the assignment of teaching the other elders. And he said, of course, I can teach you. Because I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And then he now says in verse 1, Also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. That actually has been the theme he has been going through. He has been saying, we suffer with him now. Partakers of the suffering, and then we're going to reign with him later. We're going to be the uh, partakers of the glory that shall be revealed. That's the uniform testimony of the New Testament. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join tears with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And all the apostles, all the whole of the New Testament, they testify that although there is suffering now, although there may be persecution now, there will be, at the final time, reigning with the Lord, there will be glory that shall be revealed. He now comes to verse 2 in First Peter chapter 5. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. You will remember, I already made allusion to it, that this was the commission, commandment, commitment, that the Lord had given to this uh, Apostle Peter, before he left, in John chapter 21, reading from verse 15. John 21, 15, So, 
When he had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He says unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my lambs. He says, The proof that you are going to show that you love me is that you will feed my lambs. You understand why? Jesus Christ was not going to remain here on earth forever, but his body, the body of Christ. Members of the body of Christ, the redeemed, the people he brought into the kingdom by the death that he died and by the sacrifice that he made. All those people, they represent him. If you really love me, there is one way you are going to show that. Here is my floor. Here is my sheep. Here are the redeemed of the Lord that I brought into the kingdom by the sacrifice that I made. Feed them. Feed the lambs. And then he tells, he asked again in verse 16, he says unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? There's no comparison now the, the first time. Lovest thou me more than, more than these? Maybe more than your family? Maybe more than the fish you have got? Maybe more than all the other brethren? But now there's no comparison. Do you really love me? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then he replied again, he says unto him, yes, Lord. That knows that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, the little ones, the young ones, and then feed my sheep, uh, the, the developing, growing ones. In verse 17, he says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Where was he grieved? It was, it was a suggestion of sieve. I told you the first time I love you, don't you believe me? And I told you the second time I love you, don't you believe me? You ask me the third time, I remember now that I denied you three times. And uh, I've changed, I've come back to you. I've laid everything upon the altar now. The net is gone. The thoughts of the past, everything gone. All the unfaithfulness is gone. I now want to be faithful, I want to be loyal, I want to be committed. Yes, of course, I love you. He was grieved because he asked him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That's the important thing. If we're leaders in the church, if we're workers in the church, any area of work we're doing, there must be an area, an aspect of that ministry, of that work, that makes you to actually feed the people of God. Actually, as you look at the Bible, and you look at uh, God giving leaders to the people of God, uh, the central reason, the major reason, the important reason, why he has given them those leaders, whether the leaders are men or the leaders are women, is that they will feed the people of God. In Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. And I will give you pastors, I will give you shepherds, according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. God was promising the children of Israel, he said, there is one indispensable thing you need in your life, and that is leaders, teachers, and the pastors, shepherds, that will feed you. What were they to feed them with? Not rice and beans, not the tangible stuff, food stuff that we eat. It's talking about spiritual thing. Because the physical food feeds the body. The spiritual food, the spiritual diet feeds the soul, feeds the spirit. It says they will feed you with knowledge. The knowledge of the word of God. Taking the word, reading the word, interpreting the word, explaining the word, making the people of God to have the knowledge of the Almighty. Not only that, they will feed you with understanding. They will take that word out of the white, and black and white in the Bible. They will explain it to you. It will give you understanding, practical wisdom that you will know how to worship God, that you will know how to follow God, that you will know how to live in this world, that you will know how to overcome temptation, that you will know how to overcome the devil, that you will know how to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. It's, the knowledge is not enough. Many, many leaders or many preachers, that's the mistake they make, especially when they have read some books about the Bible and some commentaries. And then they take the word of God, they feed the people with knowledge. 
interpretation is there, explanation is there, but the application of the word of God that gives us understanding so that we'll be able to know how to move out to walk in the crossroads of life, so that we'll be able to know how to overcome the devil and live the victorious life that is missing in their preaching. But you know, it tells us that we're to feed the people of God with knowledge, with understanding, or the real knowledge of the word, or the applied knowledge that gives us wisdom that makes us to know how we're going to live. In fact, as you look at the word of God, here is something that you discover. That when God chooses a leader, whether in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, he chose those leaders so that the leaders will be able to teach the people the word of God. In First Chronicles chapter 11. First Chronicles chapter 11, reading verse 2. And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou was he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord thy God, listen to this now, the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. Can, can you see those two things together? You will feed my people Israel. You will lead my people. You will be the ruler over my people Israel. When God chooses somebody to lead, it is so that he will feed the people with knowledge, with understanding. In Proverbs, I'm reading to you from chapter 10, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 21 that you need to understand that feeding means that you are feeding them with the knowledge of the word of God. The leaves of the righteous feed many. That is those leaders, those elders, and those workers that God has chosen in the church. They are to be righteous. Because without being righteous, you will not be able to feed them with the knowledge of the word of God. And you know he's talking about the word. I told you already, as a physical food feeds the body. The spiritual food, the word of God, is manna, the spread of life from heaven, feeds the soul and feeds the spirit. That's exactly what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew chapter 4. Reading there in verse 4, and he said, and he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Why not? Because man is not only body, it's body, soul, and spirit. And the food that we eat, maybe three times a day, it only feeds the body. And that's not enough. And this body eventually will die and will be buried in the grave. What are we thinking about the development of the spirit and of the soul? That's why the physical food is not enough. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what will make man to live, that he is have eternal life, maintain eternal life, and live the life that will be glorifying unto the Lord. Come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Paul the Apostle now speaking to uh, the leaders of the church. He says in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to do what? Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Because he has purchased the church with his own blood, it shows you the importance of the church. The price that was paid on the church. The very precious blood of the eternal Son of God. And now he says, you are chosen leaders, overseers, rulers over the people of God. You understand that that responsibility was given to you by the Lord himself, by the Holy Ghost. He says, all the flow over the week. The Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Here is what you are to do. You are to feed the church of God. God. Please come back to First Peter chapter 5. Reading there, verses 1 and 2 again. In First Peter chapter 5, it says, The elders which are among you, I exhort, admonish, I teach, I instruct, whom are also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I saw it all, I knew it all. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, looking to the future. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking oversight thereof. Uh, you have insight, you have oversight. You are thinking of the need of the church. You are thinking of the needs of the people over the which the Lord has made you. Overseer, ruler, or leader, or pastor, or shepherd. But then he tells us the motive. It tells us the reason, the cause, the root cause from within. He puts it in this way, not this, but this. 
Not because of this, but because of this. See the way he uses that in the latter part of verse 2. Not by constraint, but willingly. That means that if we're leaders in the church, if we're workers in the church, we're not doing it because we have to do it. We're not doing it because it's by constraint. We're not doing it because it is by force. Not by constraint, but willingly. Then he says, not for filthy lucre, not because of what we're going to get out of it, the money we're going to gain out of it, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. He goes on to verse 3, he says, not has been lost over God's heritage. Not because we want to rule over people, you want to be authoritative, domineering over people. But he says, but being examples to the flock. It tells us that the attitude matters quite a lot. What was uh, Peter telling them? He was telling them that although they were elders, those elders in the churches in Asia Minor, they themselves as leaders ought to be teachable. Isn't that a lesson for us? That even though we ourselves in our various capacities, maybe as fellowship, maybe in the zone, maybe in the district, or maybe a section of the church or an important area of the work, you are leaders. We must remain teachable. And Peter must still have the opportunity of teaching the elders of the churches in Asia Minor. And they, they must understand that they must be faithful to the purpose and the function of their ministry. And whatever it is we have, it is to feed the church of God. To feed the flock of God. That's what will glorify God. That's what will please the Lord. Because that's what he has appointed us to do. That will preach, that will teach the word of God. The pure, undiluted word of God. Giving the bread of life to the people that are hungry. Both the young and the old in the church. They all need this bread of life. And if they are to remain spiritually alive and spiritually healthy and strong, we must give them the bread of life constantly and regularly. And yet you will not count the, the church work and the responsibility the Lord has given you as if it were a heavy yoke, as if it were a burden from which you are trying to be discharged. No. You will, must not be like that, and it must not be because of money, and because of what you can get out of it, you will serve the Lord, not for money, because to serve the Lord because of money is to prostitute the ministry, telling us then that our motive must be pure, and our motive must be transparent. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 14, it shows the attitude that a teacher, a leader, a worker in the church ought to have. It's not that, you know, I'm compelled to do this. Somebody is forcing this on me, no. Somebody is forcing it on you, no. It says in Romans chapter 1 verse 14, I made better to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is. It shows the attitude that a teacher, a leader, a worker in the church ought to have. It's not that, you know, I'm compelled to do this. Somebody is forcing this on me, no. Somebody is forcing it on you, no. It says in Romans chapter 1 verse 14, I made better to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at home also. That readiness of mind. That willingness of heart to do the work of the Lord without being forced to eat, without being uh, coerced into it, without uh, any threat at all. You just do it willingly with all your heart. I come to point number two now. In point number two, we're looking at model for the members of the fold. Model for the members of the fold. In First Peter chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, neither has been lords over God's heritage. Or but being examples to the flock. When, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. He was telling these leaders, he wanted them to understand, nobody was labor, laboring in vain. Because the chief shepherd, uh, that's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the Lord Jesus Christ is that shepherd that gave his life for the sheep. And uh, the, the Bible, the New Testament refers to him as a good shepherd. The Bible refers to him as a chief shepherd as well. And it refers to him as a great shepherd. As a good shepherd, he gave his life. As a good shepherd, he's caring for the church, for the people of God. Even interceding for us now as a chief shepherd, is coming again to take his people unto himself. And now he tells them, as they were laboring, they will need to be very patient. 
a patient in the sense that uh, they will not have all their remuneration now, all their reward now. It's when the Lord will come back. He will give them all the things that he knows uh, he ought to give them as a reward of their labor. And let us look at this in the latter part of verse 3. It says, but being examples to the poor. Leadership then is not only to teach but to lead. And we do not only, we do not only lead by exhortation, but by example. It says, not has been lords over God's heritage. Uh, Peter must have remembered when they were fighting for position before the Lord left them. In Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, reading there from verse 24. And the Lord told them, and there was also a strife among them, among the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, before he got to the cross, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. Stop there for a moment. You know, when you know the ways of the world, the leadership style of the world is a minus, it's a disadvantage. When you come into the church and you know you are a leader. And you know how you led in the world or how you are leading in the world. You, you must understand that the leadership role, the leadership style, the leadership approach in the world is very, very different from leadership style in the church. And uh, if you still happen to be a leader in the world, in a company or anywhere, and you are leading effectively there, you cannot totally transport and transfer all those things you are doing over there, over here in the church. It may be effective over there, it may not be effective here, because it says, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as a younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether he is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I, I the Lord, I Christ, I the chief shepherd, I am among you as he that serveth. Which means then, all we do in the church is to be service. Service unto the Lord and service to the people of God. Please come back uh, to First Peter chapter 5. Reading in verse 3, not has been laws over God's heritage. But being examples to the flock. How you need to remember that as a leader, uh, you are preaching salvation, demonstrate it. You preach holiness, demonstrate it. You preach humility, demonstrate it. You preach any doctrine of the word of God, demonstrate it. You preach that uh, families uh, should live according to the word of God. And it's symbolized by the relationship between Christ and the church. Demonstrate it. It says we should be examples of the flock of God. Uh, that you find in quite a number of passages in the New Testament. In Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. And that means we have served like a model to you. We have led, we have led by example. And it says you know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. He said, as a leader, we didn't become beggars in the fellowship. Going about saying, you know, I'm preaching the gospel. You know, I'm leading the people of God. And I don't have this. I don't have that. Uh, will you help uh, Will you help uh, me? Because um, your leader he says, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. But wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we do not have the power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Paul the apostle with all the other leaders that were working along with him, uh, they made sure that they were leading by example. And that is what makes our leadership, our pastoring, our coordinating, our teaching, or whatever it is we do, uh, that is what makes it effective. Because actually, we're leading by example in uh, First Timothy chapter 4. At this time, Timothy was a pastor in the church in Ephesus. And here was the counseling, the admonition that Paul had to give to Timothy. It says, let no man despise you. You've been a young pastor, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, 
and impurity. He actually goes through all the areas of a Christian life. And he says, uh, Timothy, tell me, what are you teaching those uh, people in Ephesus? Well, I'm teaching them that they ought to be believers. Be an example then. I'm teaching them that their word ought to be with the grace of God. Be an example of that. I'm teaching them of their manner of life, of their conversation, of their conduct, of their character. Be an example of that. I teach them about charity. I teach them about love. I teach them about that supreme love we ought to have for God. Be an example of that. I teach them about their attitude, about their spirit. About, uh, you know, their spirit or their attitude in which they do things. Be an example to you. I teach them about faith. I teach them about purity. It says, Timothy, you know what? If you are going to be an effective leader, all those points of teaching that you are teaching and emphasizing, be an example of it. In Titus chapter 2, reading there in verse 7. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Titus, here is what you have to do. I have appointed you to be over those churches in Crete. And you must teach by exhortation with authority. And yet teach by example in all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing of corruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Come back to Philippians. In Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Reading there in verse 9. Paul the apostle knew that he himself had to be an example. Therefore he told the whole of the Philippian church. He said those things which he had both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. But Paul was not the only one that was endeavoring to teach and lead by example. He had other people too. That's why he told them in chapter 3 verse 17 brethren. Be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. These Philippian believers, they saw the gospel demonstrated before them. The people of God were demonstrating how the children of God ought to live, not only by their teaching, not only by their explanation, application of scripture, but by their lifestyle, the kind of life they are living. That's what makes uh, uh, leadership trustworthy. If you are a leader in the church, you teach the word of God, and you teach the whole ramifications of everything that the Lord has revealed unto us. But not only that, you make sure that your life matches the, the, the lessons and the teachings that you are given. Exhortation on one hand, and then the example on the other hand. The model on the one hand, and the message on the other hand. In uh, First Peter chapter 5, verse 4, it tells us that when the chief shepherd shall appear, Ye shall receive the crown, a crown of glory, which fadeth not away. He was telling them that if you are so winner today, and he appears, you appear to be going through a lot, just look at the future, because in the future, the reward will come. We're told in Daniel chapter 12, the reward that will come to the people that are winning souls, turning many unto righteousness, teaching the word of God. Don't be discouraged. Keep on teaching. Keep on leading. Keep on feeding the flock of God. It's a rewarding ministry. In Daniel chapter 12, reading verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. The question is, how many people are you turning to righteousness? How many people are you leading in the way of the Lord? How many people are you helping to know the Lord and to remain with the Lord? When the chief shepherd shall come, he will examine our work, he will examine our ministry, he will examine what we have done, and he will give us reward according to what we have done. In Revelation chapter 22. Verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. Don't be discouraged then, keep on in the work of the Lord. Keep on doing everything that the Lord has appointed for you to do. And moments of discouragement might come, but look at the future. And moments of, you know, ingratitude, uh, the house fellowship you are leading, the zone you are leading, the district you are leading, it might appear that some people, uh, they, they may seem ungrateful, but keep on teaching the word of God and teach everyone. Make sure that you, you look at everyone as a member of the body of Christ. And what you would have done to Christ, you do to everyone, no matter what might be happening. In First Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, your labor will not be in vain in Jesus' name. We're now in First Peter chapter 5, and we're looking at point number 3. Point number 3, members, humility in the fellowship. Members, humility in the fellowship. In First Peter chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5, Likewise, see younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. You understand here, if you compare the word, because, you know, many people, when you read the verses of scripture, they isolate them. And many people just come to verse 5 and they isolate verse 5. Elder here is referring back to verse 1. The elders which are among you. The leaders which are among you. The pastors and the teachers and the evangelists and the Christian workers which are among you. I exhort who also I am an elder. And then it comes now. It says here younger. Actually it's referring to the rest of the people in the church. Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, yes, all of you be subject one to another. He now tells the congregation, not only that you are submissive and subject and, you, and humble before the elder or before the leaders, but even among you, brothers, brothers, sisters, sisters, uh, we are to be humble among ourselves. And then he says, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. There he tells us the importance of humility. In fact, that you find in the whole of the word of God. You'll find as you read the word of God that humility is a beautiful trait of character. It's not just an attribute reserved only for the young and the lowly. Uh, you know, when, when you think about how the people of the world, how they think about it, the people of the world, they think that the poor and the underprivileged may have reasons to be humble. Of course, they have to be humble. Why will they be proud? Do they have money? Do they have work? Do they have education? Do they have position? The people of the world think all those poor people, underprivileged people, they have reasons to be humble. But then they do not expect the rich and the men of position to be humble. In the kingdom of God, it's different. Humility is commanded. Humility is expected. Humility is appreciated in everyone. That's why it says, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder, and then all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with Humility. I want you to follow this in the word of God and see how the Lord uh, tells us in his word that humility is appreciated and pride is to be uh, jettisoned. Uh, pride is to be uh, gotten rid of in our lives. In uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2 there. It says, fulfill ye my joy. And that ye be like-minded, having the same love, having one and being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done with strife of vain glory. Nothing at all. Nothing in the church, nothing in the home, nothing anywhere. If you are a Christian, there must not be any pride, any vain glory, any strife, any contention. Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of the others that is don't look for your own advantage look for the advantage of others let this man be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God such it not trouble to be equal with God but he made himself of no reputation you hear that Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. He made himself of no reputation, but he took upon him the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that's a model we're given, that he himself, he became obedient. And as you look at uh, your Bible, here is what you find. That humility is uh, prized, is appreciated, is honored by the Lord in the watch of the Lord. And look at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. In Proverbs chapter 16, here we're told in verse 18, it says, 
pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil or the proud. It says that even when you become rich and it appears that you are richer than uh, all the people around you, if the if pride goes along with it, no matter the skill, no matter the talent, no matter the possession, no matter what we have, if pride is there, the Lord does not appreciate it. In Proverbs chapter 29, and in verse 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. And uh, we we'll see illustrations of that, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The people that were proud, how the Lord dealt, uh, you know, with the situations. But the people that were humble, how the Lord lifted them up, how the Lord exalted them. In Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, here reading from verse, uh, uh, from verse 30. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 30, open your Bible very quickly. The king spake and said, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of my, uh, of the, uh, by the might of my power, for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it was spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and it shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and it shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the, in the kingdom of men, and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. And the same hour was the same fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till the end ears were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. You know how pride brought him down. And you remember Belshazzar who also was proud and Daniel told him and eventually that hand came from heaven that wrote, you are weighed and found wanting. In the New Testament we also see the result of pride in the life of a king. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 12 Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, reading from verse 20, and Herod was highly displeased with them of and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made blasters the king Chamberlain, their friend, they desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon the said day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel sat upon a stone and made an oration unto them and the people gave a shout saying it is a voice of a god and not of a man and this man accepted that that he was he was speaking with the voice of a god and in his pride the lord smote him in verse 23 and immediately the angel of the lord smote him eh, because he gave not god the glory and he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost you see Whatever you have, if there is pride there, the Lord is against pride. But then the New Testament passage which I read tells us that he gives grace to the humble. It says, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. As you look at the records in the Bible, you will see that even men that were very, very bad, very, very wicked, the moment they became humble, the Lord showed them grace. Look at First Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21 verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab had those words that he rent his clothes and he put sack clothes upon his flesh and he fasted and he lay in sack clothes and he went softly. You know, he had, he was a wicked king and he was uh, the most wicked king almost in the whole of the land of Israel. And his wife made him to be that wicked. But when Elijah told him the word of the Lord, that the Lord was not happy with the actions he had taken, then he became humble and he went softly and the word of the Lord came in verse 28 to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbles himself? before me because he humbles himself before me i will not bring the evil in his days but in his son's days will i bring the evil upon his house he said i'm going to delay the judgment 
are going to withdraw the judgment. It will not come at his own time. Why? Because he humbled himself. If you have been a sinner, or if you have been a backslider, no matter what you have done, once you can come to the Lord in humility and say, Lord, I'm sorry for that thing I've done, and you are really humble and tender before the Lord, you will see that the Lord will show mercy and demonstrate his love towards you. In Second Kings chapter 22. Second Kings chapter 22 verse 18. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say unto him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou hadest, when you heard what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and they, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and as rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, says the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered unto thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I bring upon this place. You know why? Uh, the eyes of that king Josiah will not see the evil, not just because of the humility, because he humbled himself in the sight of the Lord. Uh, we have abundance of evidence in the word of God that if we can come before the Lord and we can be humble in the sight of the Lord, he will change, he will turn away judgment and he will deliver us from all the oppression and all the problems we may have in Second Chronicles chapter 12. Second Chronicles chapter 12, reading there verses 6 and 7. Second Chronicles chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verses 6 and 7. Still following on the attitude of the Lord towards humility, whereupon that the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, the Lord is righteous. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came unto Shemaiah, saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishashak. And then in verse 12, and when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him. And he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. That's because of the humility. And uh, then in Isaiah chapter 57, here the Lord pointedly and clearly declared what his attitude is when people hear his word and they become humble in his sight. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. For thus says the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive uh, the, the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's what the Lord is telling us today. He's telling us that we need to be clothed with humility because he resists the proud and he grants grace unto the humble. You so say, what's the Lord wanting you to do now? It's very clear from the word of God. And as you look at Micah chapter 6, Micah chapter 6, reading from verse 8, as should be, O man, what is good? What does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, thy God. See what the Lord has revealed to every one of us today. He has spoken to the leadership. He has spoken to the membership. He has spoken to every one of us. And he has told us, you now know what the Lord requires of thee. What does he require of you? That you will walk, you will do justly. You, you, you will observe the golden rule that Jesus gave. Whatsoever you want others to do, to do to them likewise, you will walk in, in, in righteousness. And you will love mercy. And you will walk humbly with thy God. As you look at what uh, the Holy Spirit has taught us today through the Apostle Peter. How do we measure up if we're leaders in the church of God? If we're part of the people that are being led 
in the church of God. Are we a witness? Are we witnesses of the sufferings of Christ? Do we witness that in our lives? Are we partakers of his suffering? Are we having the confidence and the faith and the hope that we shall be partakers of the glory that shall be revealed if we're leaders and we're given opportunity? Are we feeding the flock of God in the area of what the Lord has committed into your hand? No matter what area it is, it's not only when you are standing by the pulpit, are you truly, lovingly, willingly, cheerfully feeding the people of God with the word of the Lord? Are you doing it not by force, not by constraint? Are you doing it willingly? Are you doing it cheerfully? Are you doing it not for money, not for filthy lucre, not for seeking position, exaltation? Are you doing it with a ready mind? Are you doing it not because you want to lot things over the people of God, domineering over the people of God? Are you an example over the flock of the Lord? Are you humble? Those who are younger, are they humble before the elders and the elders themselves? Are we like Jesus Christ that will bend low and wash the feet of the saints? Are we humble under the mighty hand of God? Don't you understand? Whenever you are ministering, whenever you are preaching, whenever you are singing, whenever you are doing anything, you are under the hand of the mighty God. Do you do it with humility? Because it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and then it will exalt you in due season. In any way we have found that we have not actually done everything according to the word of the Lord. We can come like Ahab. We can come like other people and submit ourselves before the Lord and be humble before the Lord and repent before the Lord. The Lord will forgive. The Lord will have mercy. And the Lord will turn everything around. And from now on, our ministry done in humility will be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Would you please rise up so we can pray together. Now, whatever the Lord has revealed to us, in the way we have been working for the Lord, any area of the work you are, uh, you are feeding the people of God, you are doing it will willingly, you are doing it cheerfully, you are doing it with all your heart, you are doing it with love, you are not being forced to do anything, you do it as a sacrifice of love unto the Lord, and then there is no pride in it at all. You are not like Nebuchadnezzar. You are not like Belshazzar. You are not like Herod. You are humble under the mighty hand of the Lord. You are saying, Lord, I could do nothing except by you. Everything you give me to do is just a privilege. Let's come to the Lord. And uh, wherever we are wrong, let us apologize and repent before the Lord. And the mercy of the Lord is available. Then we can move on and go on working for the Lord the way he has ordained.